Welcome everyone to the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. This is the, the third talk in this term and in fact it's also the penultimate talk. We've got one more coming up next week before the term ends. Uh, my name is Raphael Fazel. I'm the co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. I've got a few words for those who are joining us for the first time just so everyone understands how the Talking Animal series works. We will start with a presentation by our speaker that will last somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes. And we will then move to a discussion Q&A part of the event. The uh, talk will end at 6.30 p.m. UK time. Uh, everyone's warmly invited to participate in the discussion. We will be recording the presentation bit, but not the discussion part, so you should all feel um, you know, not intimidated and really come in with any questions and, and comments you might have. If you would like to come in, can I please ask you to use the raise hand function, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom app, um, clicking on a little smiley face. If that doesn't work for you, you can also use the chat box. I will have all the microphones on, on mute until we reach the discussion part. As I mentioned, we're recording this, so you can watch it later on our website or send the link to a friend if you like. Okay, I think this is all as far as uh, um, housekeeping is concerned, and it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, and that's Andrew Fenton. Andrew Fenton is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Dalhousie University in Canada. In his research, he focuses on animal philosophy and animal ethics, with a particular focus on animal research ethics. He has published widely in numerous uh, academic journals, uh, such as Biology and Philosophy, the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare Ethics, and the Canadian Journal of Law and Jurisprudence. He's also written numerous book chapters, including in the Routledge Handbook of Neuroethics and the Routledge Handbook of Philosophy of Animal Minds. Uh, in addition, Andrew uh, was one of the co-authors of the book Chimpanzee Rights, the Philosopher's Brief, published by Routledge in 2019. And he's also a co-editor of the book Neuroethics and Non-Human Animals, published by Springer in 2020. Uh, Andrew's also been a member of the subcommittee of the Canadian Council on Animal Care, working on the revised text of the Council's ethics document. And in his presentation today, he will be exploring that revised text with us. Andrew, thanks so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thanks, thanks so much, Raphael. So can everyone see the slides now? Is that is that visible? We can see the slides, but we can also see um, your applications on the bottom. Ah, that's an interesting problem. How about that? that? Is that... Now it's fine. Yeah, they've disappeared Great. now, so you're good. Super. Thanks for that uh, a very, very kind introduction. And thanks for this opportunity. It's really great to hang out with folks and uh, chat about this work. Here's a disclosure from me. So uh, as Raphael has mentioned, I have served and, and maybe continue to serve. It depends on how you understand the status of when you give feedback on various things. Um, I've served on the subcommittee for the Canadian Council on Animal Care, revising their core ethics document. Uh, during that relevant period, I've been uh, informally consulting with Beagle Alliance, and I've also been serving on a panel on the use of non-human primates in research or science for the National anti Section Society. And then for a, a declaration, I've, tr I've done my due diligence to properly source claims in various ways, and then everything else uh, is me. It's my own view on things. So here's the outline. So I'll give you some background, and then I'll give you some comparisons between the current uh, Canadian Council on Animal Care, I'll call it the CCAC, but it's the current Council on Animal Care's ethics statement, the Tri-Council Policy Statement, which is the one used in Canada for uh, human-based human uh, scientific activities, and then the CCAC's uh, revised document. Though importantly, at the public review stage, everything I say and draw from is publicly available. Uh, and so not, I'm under a gag order, so nothing, nothing going on currently I can talk about. Um, uh, you'll have to wait until the final product is out before I could uh, speak to the final product. 
Um, I'll talk about some of the ethical advan advances that you can see at the public review stage draft document. And then I'll talk about needed future directions. And this is a it's more of a, um, a more globally relevant discussion there. This is very Canadian focused up until then. And then you'll see where that goes. So just on the Canadian Council on Animal Care, it was created in 1968. It's a nonprofit, non-governmental uh, institution. Um, as I say here, its primary function and, and what folks think about in my world, so at un in universities, is that they actually certify institutions that then are eligible for federal funds from our national tri-agencies. And those are the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, and then the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, uh, SHRC, which is the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. That's the one that I would go to as a philosopher for most of my funds if I was applying for grants, uh, which I don't do often, we're philosophers. Um, but then NSERC and CIHR are uh, the primary funding sources still, that, like the majority funding sources for the CCOC that they do use. Uh, they get a lot of money now from member dues, um, uh, that is from folks that are, that are getting certified. Um, it certifies uh, laboratories that are awarded uh, uh, contracts to the federal government. If you go to their certified institutions list on their website, you can see that there are a number of laboratories associated with government departments and agencies. Um, it, uh, in their own words, it provides um, the only uh, national oversight of animal-based scientific uh, activities in Canada. They operate without the force of law. I'll qualify that in a bit, but in some important sense, they do. They, they don't have officers that are empowered by law. Um, they cannot uh, pursue, pursue remedy in court. They're not empowered to do that. And so that's the sense in which I mean that. They're also without any direct accountability to an officer ministry. If there's any Canadians in the room, you can always try this out by emailing various MPs, which I do and have done on this. And you get the you get battered around for a while until someone responds to you. But it's clear there's no uh, direct accountability to an officer ministry at the federal level. So just to bring some of these points home, the certification through the CCC is largely voluntary. I put that in a scare cost because it's a complicated uh, regulatory space. Again, if it's a, a department in, uh, related to government or it's receiving federal uh, funds through contract or through the tri-councils, um, these institutions must be certified from the, the CCAC. I say largely voluntary in some of those contexts because, of course, universities by their nature can survive without that kind of funding. Uh, and so uh, it's voluntary in that sense. It's a, it's still coercive in the under, understanding of coercion through uh, human-based research ethics. This is not this is not where there isn't pressure to do this because there are certain funds that will ride on eligibility, and the institution itself will only be eligibility to these federal agencies if it's certified. And that includes for folks like me who don't do animal-based research, human-directed or animal-directed. Um, and so it's voluntary in some sense and, and coercive in another. On the whole, private industry doesn't have to be legally obligated. That will only happen if, they're, if they have to get licenses uh, under relevant legislation uh, or under contract with the uh, relevant uh, government departments that I've mentioned before. Only one of our provinces and territories has a statute dedicated to animal scientific use. It actually doesn't mention the CCAC in its legislation that is in the statute. You can uh, look that up. I forget its name right now. Um, but the reason why this all gets very complicated is the bullet point underneath that. So you do find the CCAC referenced as welfare thresholds in some Canadian legislation, and that will include some provincial legislation that has to do with uh, animal welfare. So the Nova Scotia um, Animal Protection Act 2018 now uh, does refer to the CCAC um, as a welfare threshold if a laboratory is being investigated for what seems to be a violation of the act, because they can't be in violation of the act if they're compliant with the CCAC's guidelines, that's very much in the in the statute. Uh, the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency can actually require certification um, for certain things like importing monkeys. I think annually there's a limit of 2,500 a year. Um, but anyways, that's just to make things a little bit more complicated for the for the, the uh, regulatory regime. 
So the CCAC is revising their ba basic ethics document. Uh, their current ethics statement hasn't been revised since 1989. I think it's still available on their site if you want to have a look. Uh, here's a, a little image of the revision process, again, taken from their site. It goes through several stages. You've got an expert review, public review, the the content I'm giving you today, the draft that I'm drawing from, that's from the public review stage. It's past that stage now. Um, and so if you look down further, you'll see uh, where that should be uh, falling. So uh, as understood in that way, so it's past public review, it's in its final stages of revision now, just by um, implications of logic there. The CCAC's current document, again, the one available online that's been available since 1989, doesn't actually have any explicit ethics principles. Now, it's a controversial claim, and that is controversial because of the use of the three R's. Uh, I will talk about some of what's implicit in the current document, because um, I think it was actually quite a well-written document, all things said, when you compare it with uh, other documents uh, of the time and later on the use of animals in science. Uh, Russell and Birch's three R's are, are mentioned. Uh, they're limited in the scope. I'm going to explain to you what those are in a second. But those are the only explicit principles mentioned in the current document. And I would put to you that they're not real ethics uh, principles, not least of which because Russell and Birch in their 59 book disavowed doing ethics in the whole book. And that's where the three R's first appear. So as they envision them, uh, they're not actually envisioned as ethics principles. You can make an argument, and some 3R scholars have, that they're based on, on uh, at least the principle, the ethics principle of avoiding unnecessary harm. I think that's a, a reasonable take on the 3Rs. I've suggested that myself because I think it's a reasonable take. But it's important to see that the 3Rs actually themselves aren't ethics principles for Russell and Birch in their 59 book, though they get talked that way a lot uh, around the world uh, when you look at policies and regulations using the three R's as a framing. So here's a little bit about those three R's just to, to get you um, up, up to speed on that if you're not familiar with it. So replacement comes in two varieties. You have absolute replacement where you move away from using sentient animals in scientific activities. And then you have a uh, relative replacement, and that has to do with choosing animals who are less likely to be vulnerable to the kinds of harms that an animal would otherwise experience. Complicated way of saying that and trying to avoid phrases like less sentient, uh, because I'm not actually convinced that that phrase makes sense. Um, uh, uh, it would it involves some kind of gauging that doesn't really exist, uh, at least in the philosophy of animal cognition and in animal ethics. I don't think it would survive uh, much scrutiny if, if, it's, if it's applied. But there is sense to be talking about less susceptible to certain kinds of harms, um, simply because of the kind of endowment the relevant animals have. And so that I think that does make sense within that framing. Reduction comes in two forms, and these are actually in Russell and Birch's book. You will see them in the CCAC as well. Their description of reduction only talks about one, but you'll see the other appear in some of the other material on their site. So the first one is just any move to reduce the animals that are proposed to be used in a, in a relevant pro protocol or study. Uh, and the other one is reducing them to the minimum amount that's needed to get the sought after scientific outcome. Both of those senses of reduction are actually in the Russell and Birch book, just spread out in the book. Um, if you wanted to know where, where to find them, just email me sometime and I can give you the page numbers and I'll give you the bibliography so you know what book I use uh, for what edition of that. And, and then refinement, it has to do with eliminating unnecessary um, a negative welfare impact. But for Russell and Birch, and this is sometimes it gets forgotten, folks that talk about this are usually better about this now. So this would be true um, maybe in the late 90s when folks were talking about refinement. But now it's generally recognized that it includes promoting positive welfare, not just avoiding, eliminating, or ameliorating unnecessary negative welfare. But it is important to know that Russell and Birch seen both those aspects in refinement in their 1959 book. And so the fact that it took a while for that to get uptake is, um, is important to sit with. Also, one of the things that's important to sit with here, and I'll throw it in as something to think about, Russell and Birch weren't skeptics. 
of animal sentience among vertebrates. They assert they they make a pitch for all vertebrates being sentient, and then they hand wave towards some invertebrates being sentient. They uh, mention cephalopods in their book. It's just their book then turns towards only vertebrates. But they mention even in fifty nine that they could have had their arm twisted on cephalopods. This is something just to, to note because it's been a long journey and a contentious one that's still contentious in various fields. Uh, but this framing book for the three R's wasn't skeptical on vertebrate um, consciousness or sentience, that is the ability to have phenomenal ex uh, states or experience. So back to the lacking explicit principles, here's what the three R's can't do. And I mean, logically can't. So that you don't get a stronger claim than that. So they can't actually challenge the overall ethical legitimacy of using animals in science. It's not their function. So it's about it's about unnecessary um, harm or unnecessary inhumanity would be the actual phraseology used by Russell and Birch. Um, but that already assumes a certain kind of use in science. It can't actually challenge the ethical legitimacy that causes the the animal use causes severe harm. Uh, that you know that reflects some of the use of animals in scientific research. Toxicology testing comes to mind, uh, which would have been done uh, at that time as well. So they're well aware that the three R's can't challenge that. Uh, it also can't challenge the normalization of killing of animals and after their scientific usefulness ends, because it's not on their radar. The three R's. It's a. It's about you know moving into their use and then their use. Uh, and so I can't deal with the normalization of, of killing animals. And just as a reminder of this, uh, I would recommend Larry Carboni's work on this. He's now a retired uh, laboratory animal veterinarian, writes a lot on, on issues having to do with animals used in science, writes a bit on ethics. Don't always agree with them, but I don't always agree with myself from time to time, given some of what I've published over the years. It's the journey of a philosopher. Um, but I do recommend Larry Carboni because he has a razor sharp focus on some of these issues. Uh, and he's one of the ones that will be the first to admit that most animals uh, continue to be killed in research. And uh, lots of that isn't an act of mercy. Lots of that has nothing to do with welfare indication. Uh, and he says this as a, as a retired la laboratory animal veterinarian. So the current situation uh, regarding the absence of explicit ethics principles that is in the 1989 document strongly contrasts with what's present in human research ethics documents. And this uh, strong contrast is a contrast that would exist uh, since about, you know, 79-ish, we've the Nuremberg Code has uh, some of what filters into explicit ethics principles in what you would take to be contemporary const ethics constraints on human-based, human-directed research. But um, the, real the real appearance of explicit ethics principles, ones that an ethicist would recognize, you see in the Belmont Report in 1979 in the United States, and that was in response to a whole bunch of scandals uh, and research atrocities like the Tuskegee um, studies, uh, syphilis studies in the United States. And then the TCPS, which has been around, if memory serves me, my memory is bad. So I'm not a historian, I'm a philosopher. I think it uh, was first crafted in 1998 and the TCPS 2 2022 reflects its most, uh, most recent revisions. But here are the three principles issued. If you know your uh, animal research ethics, Th these will be recognizable. Um, they reflect uh, in lots of ways the Belmont Report's uh, choice of principles. Th where the TCPS stands out from the uh, Belmont Report, for those of you who like to geek out on this stuff, and I, you know, I teach on some of this stuff and encourage folks to know this framework. Um, it's much more relational than the Belmont Report, so the um, relational matrix uh, that humans find themselves in is front and center in the TCPS2, talking about consent, harm, welfare, um, and that's really, really important. And it also stands out because it's a living document. The Belmont Report hasn't been re revised since 1979. The TCPS has and will continue to be. It's a living document. And so it's an enormous document. It's well over 200 pages long, uh, which will contrast with what's available for 
scientists who work on uh, animal-based uh, and, and often human-directed research because they don't are not asked to read that much for an ethics document. But it's over uh, 200 pages for the ethics document for human-directed, um, largely human, uh, sorry, human-based, largely human-directed research. Here's uh, some caveats now for those claims. So I think you can find an implicit ethics principle in the current document that is a 1989 document. I think you can maybe find evidence of another um, uh, implicit ethics principle there as well. This is again, my comment about actually this 1989 document, uh, given both its time and some of the passage of time uh, after, uh, was actually pretty good and pretty good in scare quotes. Um, I'm a, you know, I have an animal rights framework in my ethics. Um, and so it's going to be pretty good relative to what's, you know, possible to pitch and get through in various contexts of resistance, um, because human supremacy is alive and well, both in law uh, and in ethics, uh, particularly, uh, you know, in institutional regulations um, of animal-based, largely human-directed research. And so you have to wrestle with and, you know, live within a framing where human supremacy is alive and well. If you want me to talk about human supremacy in the q and I can. I have uh, things to say about it that are philosophical. There are philosophical reasons to reject human supremacy. Some of it will come up in the presentation. Um, just can't be done justice here. But that's always a way of constraining what will count as pretty good uh, in this area. So take that all as caveats about this. But there is a, a, an implicit concern about avoiding unnecessary harm in the current document. So that will partially resemble what's going on in the TCPS2. Uh, it says partially because you can have ethics compliant in scare quotes, animal use and animal based, largely human directed uh, scientific activities that would be just out and out prohibited in the TCPS um, tradition. Um, you can't, for instance, um, keep someone in captivity against their will. Um, you can't intentionally kill them. You can't intentionally disable them. And so there's this only partially resembles what's going on in. Um, the regula ethical regulation of human-based, uh, human-directed research. The, as I've mentioned, the TCPS also includes an additional concern for uh, welfare of the um, social groups of the research participants. And this is one of the deep relational moments of the TCPS too, is that the harm to the actual groups from which the um, volunteers will come from in, in human-based, human-directed research matters when you're talking about possible harm and minimizing harms. Um, you don't find that discussion um, readily available in a whole bunch of, of uh, the animal ethics discussions around the use of animals in uh, animal-based, uh, largely human-directed, but not wholly directed, uh, human-directed research. I think it should be there, um, you know, particularly among profoundly social animals. Primates come to mind, but most mammals come to mind for that uh, because this does have a, a harm to the groups. Um, uh, who are bonded to the individuals who who are used in these ways. Respectful treatment may actually be implicit in the current document that is a 1989 document too. There's a limit on use, so educational use comes to mind. So this is a low-hanging fruit. Um, I don't think it's a hard argument to be made that uh, using animals in harmful ways or depending on them being harmed for their use in contexts like um, uh, for your educational system, secondary schools. Um, uh, I can remember, I'm an immigrant to Canada. I, can, I uh, grew up in Northern Ireland, so I was in secondary school for a little while in my youth. And here, for instance, high schools in, say, Canada or, or the United States. It is a fairly straightforward argument for this. You can't make an argument for training here because none of these uh, students are going to be then leaping into training for... Um, uh, for um, veterinary uh, veterinary practice, or at least not many of them, if they go in that direction anyway, and there's more training to be done before they do that. Um, a number of them are not going to be going into science. Uh, and as uh, a number of people have eloquently pointed out, using a number of uh, non-animal uh, methods, uh, like um, uh, apps for dissections, you can, uh, there's actually pretty good uh, computer apps for uh, showing uh, students at, say, high school or secondary level, what a dissected animal looks like. So that'd be an, uh, an easy one to limit use on. 
Um, they also talk about physical restraint as a last resort. Uh, that can also be understood in a in a harm framing, but it can be understood in a respect uh, uh, framing, where just out of respect to these animals, you shouldn't be doing that unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, and again, we can talk about that in the Q and A about uh, what necessary means within a human supremacist framing, and particularly one that has to do with statutes and regulations. It's significantly different from respect for persons. I mentioned some of this already when talking about harm. Um, one of the ones that's glaring here for respect for persons is you can't use a human against their will ethically uh, under regulations in your country that is in the United Kingdom uh, and here in Canada. And you just can't do that. In fact, it would be assault. And so there would be um, a number of avenues uh, to seek legal remedy available in a context like Canada, including our criminal code, if that was to happen. Um, that is something that's possible um, within the uh, 1989 document. You can still intentionally maim, disable, kill, and use these animals against their will. So whatever's meant by respect, it doesn't hit the bar that you see routinely uh, in uh, animal, sorry, human ethics directed towards humans in human based, largely human directed research. I will point out that respect for persons in a very early version of it is there in the Nuremberg Code. The largest discussions in the Nuremberg Code are around things like consent and withdrawing consent during the process of being in, in experimentation. Those are the, the uh, large parts of the Nuremberg Code, and that, that sets the framing for respect for persons and things like Belmont and the TCPS. And so this is a very, very old commitment now in uh, human research ethics. Research is, tends to be this um, broadly used term for scientific activities that includes teaching, testing, and and what would normally be called research. That would be true even in the TCPS uh, uh, too. So forgive the use of research there if you're not used to it, but animal research ethics refers to the ethics of using animals in scientific activities. It's not just research as you might ordinarily think of it. Here's There's some themes then that we can actually uh, recognize, and I think we should recognize between the current 1989 document and the draft document, avoiding unnecessary harm. That's going to be really important here. Sorry, as I, I look, I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time to make sure I stay within limits. Uh, promoting positive welfare, really, I, I mentioned to you why that's so important. Requiring sufficient expected benefit, that's there in both the um, public review stage document, the draft document, and the current 89 document, and acknowledging there must be limits to use. Uh, and that includes educational settings. Again, low-hanging fruit, or what philosophers call like high-hanging fruit. It's, it's, in, it's meant to elicit in you the image of going to a, a lemon tree or an apple tree and easily picking one of the fruit from the branches. It's something that shouldn't require a lot of, a lot of intellectual effort. So I think one of the explicit uh, advances, or sorry, the one of the clear advances here is the explicit use of three core ethics documents, again, at the public review draft document. These are the three that are there. So respect, that is for the animals to be used. Non-maleficence, so avoiding unnecessary harm, again, always in scare quotes, and sufficient benefit of the proposed use. Th this alone, from my perspective as an animal ethicist, uh, again, with all the caveats I've already given you, I think moving to explicit core ethics principles that an ethicist will recognize, even if they disagree with them, is a massive move. It's massive. It's, uh, it's, it's long overdue. So I don't think it's massive in the sense of, wow, this, this is something that is you know, really risky. This shouldn't be risky at all. It's a failure of the community of folks who defend the use of animals in scientific activities that it takes this long to get explicit embrace of core ethics principles that would be recognizable by an ethicist. So this is not risky at all. This is long overdue. It should be an embarrassment to the Canadian um, community that it's taken this long. That's not on the CCAC. It's an embarrassment of the community who are pro-using animals in scientific activities. And so it shouldn't be risky. It should be an embarrassment that it's taken this long. But I think it's a real advance. Like it's a serious advance. It shows that in this community, ethics will be taken more seriously than it was before, because these are recognizable principles.
And for what it's worth, uh, these actually try to pitch. The respect is pitched as a limiting consideration on the use of animals. And so it actually uses the term limiting or limits in the public uh, uh, document. And I think it's important to see respect as limits. That's how it's always been used uh, in uh, research ethics. Um, uh, however you water that down means you're watering down respect. That would be the, the respect has had that use and its understanding. You see that in Belmont and you see that in the TCPS. So there are uh, things to say here. So when you're talking about, for instance, limiting animal use, that is a logical consequence of animals mattering at all. This is where I'll put on my academic hat. Um, versus my personal uh, animal rights perspective. It doesn't matter what kind of importance, moral importance you place on the interests of other animals and their well-being. If you if you place any at all, it means you logically have to exclude certain uses as too trivial. Uh, otherwise, that means nothing. And so if you're going to mean anything at all by animals mattering, it means that there has to be, that is logically has to be limits. I mean, this is, this is the... Um, um, the unforgiving requirements of the formal constraints of ethics if you want to work in that sandbox. And so this is something that comes out of that. Interestingly, the three R's can't deal with that. And this is not a criticism of Russell and Birch. They never said they were doing ethics in the 59 book. If they were doing ethics in their 59 book, this would be a criticism of the framework, but they weren't doing that. And the principle of respect explicitly supports limits. And so this can become a principle orientation for the CCAC in a way that it couldn't before, even if it was implicit in what they were committing to. So even if before it was implicit as a, as a commitment of respect, uh, they can do it now explicitly. There are 10 principles of application. Uh, my thanks to Letitia Mennell, who's a, a feminist philosopher of biology here at Dell. Um, in full disclosure, my life partner. Um, but she drew up this um, image for it because we have both used the public review stage document in our classes. And it's handy for you to see. You can see the relationship of the core principles to the principles of application. In my words, I understand the principles of application to be how you can actually see these align with the basic intent of the core principles, albeit uh, in a way that will nudge the community a little more on being more ethically aware or competent, but in ways that will keep people around the table. So it's the, in ethics, it's called non-ideal circumstances. This is not ideal yet. The ideal is what I think would be the alignment of animal ethics and, and human research ethics codes. Um, but this is, you know, a step in, in those directions. So it's a non-ideal circumstances. I can talk about the technical use of that in the Q&A. Here's uh, four principles of application I'll point out because I think they're really important. So killing an animal, even humane, and that's huge, is considered to be a harm. The reason why this is really important is, again, the normalization of killing. If this, if this can be drummed into uh, folks that are working with animals in a captive scientific context, that's a good thing in itself, that they could actually start thinking of killing as a harm. If you want me to pitch the philosophical reasons for that, I can in the Q&A. This is not arbitrary. It's well philosophically motivated. Uh, controversial in some circles, but I think it shouldn't be. Captive environments should provide a, a, a life worth living. That means the sum total of the ex experience of the life should be um, positive and their needs are met. They should be humanely trained. That means I work on sustained descent stuff with animals and research ethics. If that's going to be overridden here, it has to be for compelling reasons. Um, uh, if you know my work, you know I would disagree with that kind of caveat, but... Um, that's not relevant to this content. Uh, whenever possible, the appropriate animal should be retired, rehomed, or released. Uh, again, uh, I think this is the least that we owe these animals. Um, I think that whenever possible is kind of slidey here, but again, that's me versus the actual document itself. Uh, so I'm putting on my personal uh, philosopher's hat as I say that, uh, but it's the least that we owe these animals is if they could actually live uh, free of these pressures and harms and stresses, they should be given that chance. So the data around the world, and this is, I'll go through rather quickly at this point, just to keep within time, 
Uh, one of the things that's actually largely missing from discussions in animal research ethics is justice. And as I've mentioned to you, uh, this actually goes back to Belmont as an explicit ethics principle. Uh, you can see it going back to Nuremberg, of course, because that was coming out of the atrocities done during the Second World War in the name of science in primarily Germany, I think. I don't think they were trying anyone from Japan uh, during that, tri that particular trial, but it was uh, German uh, scientists, physicians, and folks that were complicit in those research atrocities um, that were being tried and the Nuremberg Code came out as a part of the judgment, uh, finding a number of those folks guilty, a number of them were killed for that. Um, but justice is just largely absent. There, there is a reason for this. It's not accidental. There's a reason for this. Once you actually consider justice, you need to consider formal justice. Formal justice that like should be treated like this goes back to Aristotle. I kid you not. Uh, so this is not a new principle. This is an old principle. I don't think you get much older than this uh, for a classical or for discussions, historical discussions of ethics. And um, what it has to do with relevant similarities and, and relevant dissimilarities. If you're used to that way of discussing ethics, so are animals relevantly similar? Are they relevantly dissimilar to allow for differences? That's a formal justice consideration. It's a very, very old commitment. You Interestingly, you don't see it in a lot in animal research ethics as policy. The reason for that, I, I would go as far as to say at all, the reason for that is it can't support human supremacy because once you challenge why humans are protected, under law or policy, your responses to that, because you can't just say because they're human, because I would just ask you again, yeah, but why, will, in, will involve considerations that have nothing to do with taxonomic identity, won't have to do with your shared common ancestry, for instance, won't have to do with anything that a biologist is going to use to count you as a member of our species, Homo sapiens. And that means that whatever you're talking about will either exclude some uh, uh, humans and include a, a number of uh, non-human animals or include all the humans you want to include and a lot of non-human animals. And again, philosophy is not going to tell you where to go here, but there is an unforgiving logic to the um, to the ethics space here. So here's what would happen if you actually took formal justice seriously. And again, a principle that goes back to Aristotle. So we actually got animal ethics to the position of, you know, responding to an Aristotelian principle. Here's a number of things that would actually have to be banned. And these would have to be banned because there has to be some kind of an alignment here between animal and, and human research ethics codes. And it doesn't matter how much of an alignment you sort that out yourself. Again, why are humans protected the way they are? Whatever answer you give there, that will tell you where you need these aligned with the animals, because there will be animals included in whatever you give as a response. It'll probably be more than just primates, probably will include dogs and cats, probably rodents. Um, but whatever happens with that alignment, you need to ban certain uh, scientific activities which are banned in human research ethics. That includes intentionally lethal outcomes. Uh, you need to, to require the retirement because you don't get to actually keep them in captivity in perpetuity, uh, at least not captivity that's uh, supportive. Uh, you know, cats and dogs are complications for this sort of thing. Uh, and the use of third party surrogates. And this is an old discussion in animal uh, research ethics. Uh, that's why I've used some of the citations I've had. This is not a new consideration. Saponsis so discusses this in his 87 book. And uh, my position here is actually very uh, reflective of Saponsis' so view. I disagree with him with some details, but not on uh, major issues of substance. And you see it in the Caviolari and Singer book, The Great Ape Project, which brought a whole bunch of biologists together with philosophers to talk about fundamental rights for great apes. And so you see it there as well. Why that would be important? Well, it depends on uh, um, how you align the animal and human research ethics. Again, that's your journey about why you think humans should be protected, but it may well end up protecting rodents, fish, and relevant vertebrates. How many invertebrates is up to you to actually engage with the relevant animal welfare science, but at least cephalopods, probably invertebrates like bees. Genetically modified animals, uh, it is important not to have them drop off our radar, our ethics radar, simply because we're messing around with um, what is in their genotype and then expressed in their phenotype. And then animals who otherwise would be harvested for the tissues and organs. This is part of the problem with the three R's. You get part of the problem with the three R's. You have 
tensions that get generated. So the tension between reduction and refinement is one of them. So if you're using animals over an iterated space, that is more than once. A reduction might in favor focusing and using reusing an animal, whereas refinement comes into play because that's in tension with watching out for a negative welfare impact. And if you actually focus in a negative welfare impact, that can be in tension with reduction because it'll favor including more animals instead of uh, uh, just focusing in on reusing some others. Uh, and because of that reduction effort, it can, it can actually predispose the decision context to kill animals to harvest their tissues. Now, I hope I don't need to say to you that in human research ethics, you don't get to kill your subjects after they're used, even if it would actually reduce the use of humans in the future, because you don't get to actually harvest their organs and tissues without their consent, and certainly not in a life-threatening way. Uh, and so if you've got an alignment of human and animal uh, ethics, uh, or research ethics, uh, that's going to actually cover some animals too. So this is the conclusions, just to get to the, to the Q&A now. And uses some core ethics principles, and I think just in their on their own, that, that's a huge deal, long overdue, but a huge deal that's going to get done. And it has some considerations in this revised document again at the public review stage that actually re re reflects insights from animal bioethics that killing can be a harm, for instance, uh, that using animals against their will is an ethic ethical big deal. That's another. Uh, and so it's it's important that it's actually reflecting those moves now and and anchoring them into to uh, explicit ethics principles. Uh, it is important at some point that we take ethics seriously enough that we actually make sure it actually brings in non-anthropocentric justice considerations, but that will require an alignment of some animal use and human use in uh, science. And that will mean that a number of practices that are fairly normalized right now in science would have to go uh, if that alignment happens. But if we're going to take ethics seriously, uh, that's what has to happen and as the ideal end goal, at least for folks like me. And again, I can, I've given you a pitch philosophically for why that's the case. Uh, happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. And thanks. That's it.